welcome to this CNBC Africa panel discussion. Our topic today is unlocking digital capabilities for African women entrepreneurs. Now, financial exclusion in the age of access is leaving many female-led businesses behind. Closing and bridging the access gap is crucial for the survival of these businesses as they navigate a post-COVID world. What is the way forward for African women entrepreneurs to achieve full financial inclusion, even in the face of African realities and challenges? So that's going to be our topic for today. I'm your host for today, Esther Awoni. Thank you for joining us. In the meantime, let's meet our panelists. And on the topic, African women entrepreneurs unlocking digital capabilities in the age of access, the panelists are Ida Diara, Senior Vice President and Head of Sub-Saharan Africa at Visa. Flora Mutahi, Founder and CEO of Melvin Marsh International. Juliette Ehioman, Director, West Africa, Google and Lindeka Zedze, Head of Non-Banking Financial Institutions and Global Markets at Standard Bank Group. Thank you all so much for being on the panel today. Let's get right to it. Ida, I'm going to start with you. We're talking about access. Now, Visa believes that, of course, we know that the more inclusive our financial systems become, the more everyone benefits. And now Visa believes that access exists, but it's being blocked in many forms. Could you share some insight on this? Um, you know, when you look at the impact of the pandemic altogether, it has affected pretty much everyone. Um, the way we work, the way we you know, shop, the way we relate. But I think the biggest impact that we've seen is the impact on small businesses. Um, as we you know, remain connected to small businesses throughout the continent, one thing that came clear was that, number one, um, they were, you know, saw their revenue significantly impacted. This is like uh, the result of a research we did uh, not too long ago. 85% of uh, small business owners we spoke to advised that, uh, you know, it was a challenge. When we probed them on, you know, what were the key areas of challenge for them, a couple of them, you know, that came out loud and clear was around technology. Um, they understood that um, it was critical, critical for them to ensure they would get online um, because simply this is where commerce was migrating. Consumers could not access to point of sale. Um, and more importantly, they understood that they needed to go and find customers where they were. So again, a clear guidance in terms of, um, you know, going digital, going online, accepting digital payment was what came out loud and clear. Now, when we take, a, we, we, we drill down one level, it is clear that women uh, entrepreneurs are experiencing even more challenges than the average, you know, small business entrepreneur. Um, you know, the divide from a technology perspective is a reality, even more a reality for women entrepreneurs. And our challenge, collective challenge, you know, um, as player in the payment industry is to just make sure that we provide them with access access to payment, access to digital you know, business, that we empower them with the proper knowledge and uh, give them the opportunity also to network. So that are the you know, key priorities that Ida, we thank see you. at Visa. Right, thank you so much for that, Ida. I think this would be a good time to bring in Flora, uh, a, a business owner, to just uh, because it's important that we hear some of these unique stories uh, from women entrepreneurs, how they were able to navigate uh, the, the lockdown that we saw last year and, of course, still navigating the current environment, which is in the post-COVID. Uh, now, Flora, talk to us, uh, share your experience with us, uh, how this impacted your business and how, you, how it changed your interaction and exchange with your customers and if you were able to maintain Maintain, very importantly now, uh, maintain payment channels uh, with your customers at that time. Thank you very much. And um, I guess good afternoon to everybody. Um, my, like you heard, my name is Flora Mtahi. I run a, a, a tea business. Uh, we blend and package um, Kenyan tea. 
And our biggest claim to fame is that we use naturally fresh uh, ground spices. We are flavoring them. We use um, natural herbs. So all of our products are very, very natural. So fortunately for us, during the COVID pandemic, of course, there's the first panic buying where everybody said, oh, my God, we're going to go home. And, you know, we, we actually saw our numbers completely skyrocket. In fact, my challenge was how to keep my staff safe. And I personally also had to go into the office because, you know, it's not fair to say just because you're in production and we're in management, we're not going to show up. So I, 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 I changed a little bit to flexi time, did less hours. You know, we split into two groups and we had everybody going on. The business, the business increased during the first month, I think it was March. Um, but we went into April and we began to see a slump. And everybody started saying, where is the customer going? What is going on? And, and we started, you know, of course, we were, we were all getting COVID degrees. I think we thought COVID was an event. Uh, we didn't realize it's here for a while. And um, then we started doing, um, started running financials. How many people are, am I going to release? But at the back of my mind, I kept saying, is this right? Is this fair? So what are they going to eat? So what I did is I told the team, these are the, this is the bare minimum that we have to maintain. And below this, we're not going to, we're not, we're, nobody has to lose their job. And this is the bare minimum that we have to bring in if we're just going to take a little bit of a pay cut. And um, so we quickly ran the numbers and I think we gave a small pay cut. And I remember when we were making this decision, should we or should we not? Um, my accountant's team, my accountant said, I think it's important so that everybody sort of realizes that we have to pull together. So we did a pay cut, I think, for a month. I think heading into the second month, we realized because we ran a health product, you know, everybody, everybody wanted tea, it was fine. Uh, we actually didn't suffer during the pandemic. However, we then started having to trace where is our customer, where have they gone? And um, it took me actually somebody to mention it to me and said, listen, if people are not walking the stores, where are they? Because people are consuming people that, you know, the consumer hasn't gone anywhere. And that's when we started going to online and we, we spent a lot of money and time. We actually started a new campaign called Chai Together um, during this period where we and everybody was, of course, consuming digital. And it was brilliant. It made our sales grow, How, not so much online, because when buying a packet of tea, having it delivered to your house is really not how people want to do. So we worked with the aggregators, the juniors and those kind of people to, to actually take the product. So basically, that was my COVID experience. I do know, of course, other SMEs who have had other more um, drastic experience when they were in the other industries that were really hit, you know, the, the hotels, the restaurants. Um, but basically in our food and beverage, we really did not take a hit during the COVID pandemic. Now, I was going to ask you the experience of other uh, women-owned businesses. Would you say, I mean, obviously, good that you were able to quickly uh, go online and, of course, maintain uh, engagement with your customers. But would you say that, in your opinion, from what you saw on the ground, would you say that a significant number of women-owned businesses were cut, uh, were taken unawares and by surprise? Uh, those, especially those who did not uh, have access to online, uh, do not have, did not have online access or access to e-commerce as it were oh completely completely i do know um businesses that completely shut down i think there's a statistic that says um you know 50 percent over 50 percent of businesses hit, were hit with very high or negative effects of the covid and especially the ones who are in the sectors like i mentioned the health um you know the, the hotels not sorry not health the hotels uh, restaurants, accommodation, but even people in clothing and, and whatever, unless they were able to pivot. Now, fortunately for us in Kenya, what the government of, of um, Ministry of Industrialization did for us is they turned around and they said, you know what, we're having a supply chain problem with our masks. We are only committing to buy masks made in Kenya. So the whole fashion industry came together and repurposed their industries. They were taught, they were certified, they were trained. And it was just them pulling together. It's nobody really came to do it. And, and they, they rolled out masks. I mean, factories were rolling out 10,000 masks in, in, in a couple of days and went out on the streets and actually, and, and actually sold. So some were able to repurpose themselves. But when you're looking at, let's say, the women who maybe feed construction sites, you know, construction sites also slowed down because nobody was coming to work. Now, those women, remember, because of house care and everything else, were needed at home. It's always a double, uh, a double, uh, I wouldn't call it a double tragedy for women, but it's always a double burden because you're expected in the office when you're running an organization, but you're also expected in the home when everybody came home. And that's what happened during COVID. 
So the women who are unable to sort of let the home continue to run or had you know, children or family that couldn't support them, what, they definitely were really, really affected. I will talk a lot, a lot about how um, transactions um, in Kenya, we do have what we call M-Pesa, which is mobile money. And uh, we have, um, you know, I think 84% uh, mobile penetration. Um, so 94, 90, 95% of that are use mobile money. So every, financial transactions still continue to happen. But however, how is delivery then going to happen? So that was what, um, that was the bigger challenge. Well, thank you so much for that, Flora. As I said earlier, it's very important that we know, uh, hear some of the stories to, un to fully understand where the pain points are, where some of those pain points are for women entrepreneurs uh, on the continent. Lindek, I'd like to bring you in here. Uh, I'd like you to weigh in here and share your perspective on the cost of exclusion for small businesses, particularly women-led businesses, and how it impacts on their growth and expansion opportunities, especially at a time like this. I'd like to thank the Visa family uh, and CNBC for actually inviting me and a warm welcome and a big thank you to our audience. I think uh, for me, um, as I said, I'm Leeds. Um, I'm a Smithson Standard Bank, huge focus in terms of the gender space and the self-elected champion. I think numbers matter. And I think uh, in the, we have in the audience, I'm sure we know how much of an impact numbers have. And I think if we bring this back to uh, the continent, we know that women account for slightly more than half uh, of the African population, but generate only a third of the continent GDP. This is of the study that was taken by um, McKenzie in 2018. And if you look at this, it means that it will take us 142 years to achieve gender parity on the continent. And more importantly, it, it means that there is a big drag on our economy. Now, if you bring it back to, this is just on women. If you bring it back to SMEs, at least 40% of SMEs in sub-Saharan Africa are women-owned, and those are the biggest employers on the continent, but only 20% of these have access to institutional finance. And I guess from a banking perspective, this is where we come in. And for me, I guess, if we look at that, is that really a cost that we'd like to pay as a continent? And I think not. And I liked what... Um, Flora said, and Flora, I've heard about you from the Lionesses of Africa, I heard about your business in London. I'm glad to be on the same audience with you. Um, so thank you for that. And my conversation, I guess, what I, want, I wanted to take this was, um, is that a cost that we really want to pay? When we talk about responsible business or responsible banking or any business that we are in, do we really want to ignore that at the cost of our economy? And if you look at what the COVID pandemic has done, it actually has shined a spotlight on exactly the burden that women actually face. We're in the forefront in terms of the healthcare and the industries that we actually um, uh, work in. And more than that, if you look at the consumption decisions on the continent, 70% of those are made by women. Those are the people you want in your business. You also want and on the table discussion with you. So I think for me, the cost is too big um, 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 for us to ignore women. And um, thank you, uh, Flora. Esther, sorry, I'll hand over back, back to you. Picking up from where we left off, uh, Lindeka, if I could just uh, uh, keep you on. Uh, now, from uh, financial institutions and gender lens impact investment. Uh, what trends are we seeing in terms of the investment strategies that focus on women entrepreneurs and how financial institutions can make this a fundamental element of business strategy? Um, firstly, uh, thank you, Esther. Sorry we lost you there, but this is the world we live in, right? Um, firstly, from a standpoint perspective, um, and I guess it's a big focus uh, in terms of gender, um, we um, so it's, about, it's a part and, part and parcel of our business. It's not a side, I guess, item. It's actually a strategy of how we lead and it it's, it's encompasses the broader ESG theme that has exploded in this environment that we find ourselves in. And I'm loving the fact that there's even a bigger focus now on the gender part in terms of financial inclusion. So from a bank perspective, it is part of our business and strategy. If you look at what we're doing from a, 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 um, an internal perspective, just on focusing on ourselves first before we actually get into other people's backyards, it is to make sure that we increase the number of business leaders within the banking group 
where the aim is to have 40% of the leaders in the bank boardrooms being 40% we also not only do that, and I guess if you look at our teams, we also know that governance teams perform a lot better. So that's a big focus. But when it comes to supporting many businesses, we're part of uh, the He for She movement, where we've actually invested, especially in women farmers and agriculture in countries like Malawi, Zambia, and across the globe. And those we have actually seen a huge impact in terms of those women businesses. And there's numbers that I can share with the audience. But that um, I think from a bank perspective, we've actually also launched the African Women Impact Fund. And the reason for this was we wanted to have a two approach. So there's an investment in SMEs, uh, which for us creates a pipeline for the fund to actually look at in the businesses that they should invest in. So the fund itself is looking to create a sustainable investment platform for women owned or women led businesses. And the real reason for us is to actually provide that general lens uh, in terms of the investment decisions that are being made and actually trying to drive that and putting money into the hands of women to manage. And numbers back the performance of those kind of teams, if you look in private equity, 20% higher returns. So from a banking perspective, that's where we are actually focusing from agenda. So in terms of them as our clients, but also creating a pipeline and an opportunity to put that in the macro space where we can have a fund that will also focus on making sure that we invest in those businesses. And um, that's where we are, I guess, um, as, uh, from a business perspective. And this is not my first foray into the conversations with Visa. This is what led us to this. I think we're aligned in terms of purpose and what we see the impact in our, our work in terms of collaboration could be in this space. So thank you once more, Visa. Thank you, Esther. All right, then uh, let me circle over to Juliet uh, from Google. Now, Google is passionate about small businesses and has been supporting uh, post-COVID recovery efforts of um, a number of SMEs. Could you share some insight on the scale of the impact on businesses, particularly on women-owned businesses and the role of innovation and creativity in the recovery process? Talk to us about your experience, what you saw on the ground, and the, just the scale of the innovation and creativity you've seen so far. Great, thanks a lot, Esther, and uh, thanks to Visa and TNBC for putting this together. I would say that absolutely, we are passionate about small, medium enterprises, and like what's been mentioned already, we do see SMEs as an engine for economic growth. In most countries across the region, uh, SMEs account for over 90% of businesses and uh, contribute over 60%, in some cases much more than that, to job creation. Now, post-COVID, as part of our economic recovery efforts in Africa, we have an initiative, and uh, there are many uh, components of that initiative. Uh, on the one hand, we're supporting small businesses to digitally accelerate because one of the implications post-COVID is the fact that digital transformation is the new normal. Uh, businesses need to really think about how to pivot effectively, how to innovate and just really leverage uh, digital tools and platforms as much as possible. And our goal is to uh, digitally accelerate 500,000 small businesses by the end of this year. And uh, we also have uh, $3 million Google.org funding, which we're putting towards education, entrepreneurship and women empowerment. Now, we've also created a platform for small businesses called Google for Small Businesses, and it has a free online success guide integrated with steps and tools required to digitally transform your business, as well as steps to adapt to the changes that have been caused by the COVID pandemic. And there's a broader mic uh, micro uh, site called Grow with Google that also has uh, uh, different digital skills training modules, webinar series that can just really help businesses to navigate this new reality of learning, working and operating remotely. We also have a program really targeted at startups and entrepreneurs. It's called Google for Startups Accelerator Program for Africa, which is a three month accelerator program to provide uh, training, mentoring, support, infrastructure to early stage technology startups. We've seen amazing growth across the continent of, uh, in the tech startup space. And I'm glad to say that women are also really pulling their weight here. We're seeing a number of women-based uh, um, startups really doing well 
being very innovative and solving local problems at scale, uh, which is great. And for all these programs, we are very intentional in ensuring that there is gender equity in participation. And um, just to also support uh, more women around embracing the opportunities around digital and digital platforms, we have some dedicated initiatives like um, Women Tech Makers, which is a conference we run on an annual basis that just really brings together women who have an interest in the tech space or who are practitioners in the tech space to get trained, to get mentored, to learn about best practices and just get inspired by what's possible. Um, we also have female Google developer groups that are sc uh, scattered across the region. So these are some uh, examples of initiatives and I do agree that it's important that we're very intentional in making sure that women are not left behind because they really uh, bring a lot to the table uh, if we think about the fact that uh, small businesses play a key role and the, the informal economy is a huge part of that and um, the majority of um, uh, Africans in the inf informal economy are women it's really really key that we're having these conversations and being very intentional to make sure that there are initiatives to support and empower Absolutely female right. entrepreneurs. Those are you know, great initiatives uh, on the part of Google to support uh, small businesses, particularly women, particularly women owned businesses. But uh, this also throws up questions about uh, affordability, ease of onboarding uh, for some uh, women owned businesses uh, who want to, who are seeking to unlock the opportunities in e-commerce. Could you speak to that point? That's an important point. And the, the beauty about digital is that it offers quite a range of opportunities. And there are a number of free tools that are, that are available, tools for training, tools for empowerment, for capacity building, as well as tools to actually get your business um, online, to create front shops and, um, and, and even to have an e-commerce e uh, store. So there are a number of things that I would encourage people to think about. One is just that uh, aspect of ca capacity building, looking at uh, developing competencies and understanding the different options and the different tools and platforms that exist to really create an online presence. It can be as simple as just a, a profile on Google My Business or on social media, um, and then you know going the extra step to leverage existing marketplaces, which are also free, where you can display products and services, um, and then building on that as well. So I would say that um, this is a, a time where there's an in invitation to all businesses to just really embrace building capacity Right. Uh, and, and there are lots of uh, free tools to really do that. There are programs run by different organizations that just really speak to this need. And as part of that, looking at the different tools that uh, just uh, are within reach and can be leveraged. Great, uh, Juliet. Uh, Ida, let me come to you. Uh, let's uh, unpack or take a deeper dive into those uh, uh, factors that uh, a cause of financial exclusion for women-owned businesses. And uh, Visa did do uh, research uh, under its uh, She's Next uh, advocacy program for women entrepreneurs. And you did um, uh, undertook a, a market research in uh, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. So just quickly share some insight on some of the key findings of that research. Why was it important for Visa to uh, expand this initiative to Sub-Saharan Africa and help us understand what you set out to achieve and of course the key findings? Yeah. A lot has been said around, you know, the importance of small businesses and the importance of women in our continent. So the fact that um, we wanted to keep the pulse and understand better how the pandemic had affected, you know, small businesses and more specifically how it has affected, you know, women owned small businesses is um, kind of obvious. You know, as we spoke to them, um, we learned a couple of things. Number one, 70% of the small businesses we spoke to of small businesses owners told us that they have seen a negative impact on their business, on their traditional you know, retail business. Um, we also found out that um, the businesses that have been between existing between zero to three years were the ones the most impacted. When we talked to them about the biggest challenges um, they were facing, 40% of, the, of them talked to us about 
um, technology challenge, um, access to e-commerce as, again, they understood the importance of, you know, getting online and accessing e-commerce. The one thing that I found very, very interesting is um, those businesses that were able to pivot and get online, 80% of them said that they were able to be a little bit more resilient and sustain their, their income. So based on that, there are a couple of you know, critical actions that um, uh, we understand either needed to be maintained or uh, accelerated. You know, first, it's about you know, making it easier for you know, businesses to get online and you know, technology is helping us, um, but we also have fintechs that are playing an extraordinary uh, role at onboarding, providing the tools, making it easier for this business to get online because you just don't sell online the same way you sell on retail. And it's really about how do we partner with them. We have, uh, with the uh, support of uh, PAGA, for example, implemented, you know, FinTech in a box, really um, merchant in a box, sorry, just to empower these small businesses with practical tools to get online, to accept payments, and be a little bit more nimble in a space that we're not necessarily familiar with. But there's another dimension that is critical, and all of the panelists have talked about it already, and it's about education. It's about making some of the tools available, creating forums where women can access you know, tips and tools on how to grow their business, because the reality is that as much as they represent you know, 58% uh, of you know, the total uh, self-employed uh, population in Africa, they are the one accessing less venture capital funds. They are the ones having less access to digital channels. And it is imperative, again, that we, we help them in that front. So many of the efforts that we, we have at Visa is to partner you know, with uh, players like uh, you know, Standard Bank, um, it's to partner with um, uh, you know, organizations like She Leads or Hand in Hand, who are focusing on reaching out to um, you know, women entrepreneurs to really make sure that they would have access to, to the right tools. And then, you know, there's another angle that is so critical. Um, it's really the funding. It is how do we help them together with the partners and the different organizations supporting small businesses make funding available to them. We've made a commitment at Visa to invest, you know, 3.5 million with organizations across Sub-Saharan Africa to support small, small businesses. So, it's really like a 360-degree well, focus. Much, Ida. Flora, and uh, like to bring you in here, not... uh, talk to, to also touch on... Thank you, Ida. Go I'd like ahead, to quickly please. bring in Flora here just to touch on uh, your recovery process so far. Uh, I know that Kenya is big on tech. Uh, you mentioned M-Pesa. Everyone knows how uh, M-Pesa has revolutionized uh, the space, the uh, tech space, the uh, fintech space uh, in Kenya. But just talk about, Ida mentioned a few uh, factors that need to uh, be taken into consideration and seriously if we're to see more uh, women-led businesses progress and be successful and get fit for the digital future. She talked about education, uh, especially around information on online access and having access and knowing the benefits of e-commerce and just having knowing the benefits of access. Talk to us about how, uh, I know that you are the leader of a private sector uh, initiative, private sector led initiative that's also supporting women businesses in this regard. Could you share more insight on that for us? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, my dear. And it's just lovely just to listen to what um, Microsoft is doing. I know I did um, during COVID, of course, we had a lot of time and I sat back and I was able to really listen to, to you, know, you know, Google your business and all the programs that she's mentioning. Um, but basically, I, I like, I think it was Ida who said, it's all about access. Women get challenged around, um, first of all, it's access, access. I always say first is even before access to, to, to finance, it's access to knowledge. How am I going to do what I'm going to do? Is there a market in what I want to do? How big is the pie? What slice of the pie do I want? Um, 
I, th I, I do think we don't have a lot of documented information around there and there's a big information gap. So access to information and how quickly you can get it to them. And I'm sure you do know that in, um, I know in Kenya, we've done a lot of um, fintech, fintech around agriculture. So now they're able to give, to give you information. This is when you're going to grow your crop. This is when you harvest it. This is what you should do at this stage. You know, send us your soil sample. We will tell you what you should grow in your particular area. So I think um, access to information is one, one very big thing. And then there's, an, of course, access to finances. And I guess that's what we've been speaking about or we always speak about. There's the collateral gap, if, anything, if nothing else. You know, how, what, when I want to borrow for my business, how, how do I borrow? And for us, the MPES, I don't know if you know, now has an arm that allows you to borrow. And you tend to find maybe over, and majority are women. They will wake up at four in the morning, apply for a loan, and it's, you know, on your phone, get if it's even $100 or $50, do their business, close by 10 a.m. and repay it back. So just that without having to be asked for collateral is brilliant. For me, what, where I tend to find a bigger gap, because it's expensive, so it's very important to turn your money around, when, is when you're going into slightly longer term funding and you need slightly bigger and you need collateral. We do know women don't have resource assets in their names. So how then are they supposed to navigate this space of, um, of, of collateral? So that's, that's, um, that's another gap that, that um, I'm, I'm glad we are discussing here with, you know, with, the, you know, with, with, with the visa and everybody else. I do know a lot of funds that are putting in support. Then we have, of course, the regulatory challenges, what's going on. So your question was really around, um, was around what do we do as an organization? I do, our umbrella body is called KEPSA, Kenya Private Sector Alliance. We house all um, business associations, private sector business associations. Like during this COVID period, one thing we did is we partnered with the MasterCard Foundation and we gave up to $15,000 to SMEs, interest-free, repayable within six months. It, the uptake was fantastic. We couldn't actually even meet the demand. We then had weekly trainings and mentorships targeting um, women and uh, young entrepreneurs on how to, to ment how to navigate, how to pivot, how to change. And a lot of it, remember women just like sometimes just listening and the support. So we just get women to speak about emotional intelligence. This happened, it happened every week during that year. Now we are doing it weekly. Um, I mean, every bi-weekly. Um, we also made sure they're not left behind. We had a program called an e-booster program where we trained them. So we'll start from business. This is how you get digital. This is how you do your, 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 your e-commerce. These are the platforms where you can put your products to be seen. We trained 2,600 um, um, women and SMEs to get onto this program. And I think our biggest success has been an Ajira digital program where we helped, um, um, we partnered with the government of Kenya, still there on digitization. So the government of Kenya is, 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 is our market. So we've trained um, all these kids to the e-booster program and they've gone into the Ministry of um, Lands, uh, well, uh, I think um, the judiciary especially, and started helping them digitize. And we help manage those. And we're tending to find the youth and the women earning up to $200, $300. You know, money they never thought they could make during this period. And we will just come out with a research that showed that we created 1.2 million jobs for the youth during this period. Other programs we had was just running a 24 hour call center where we gave information around um, regulation, around what's going on, whatever you have. There was also a helpline to the, to the health facilities for because we've been running, having curfews. So women who are in labor or distressed who need to move around in the middle of the night. Uh, if you want to report abuse, of course, there's been a lot of abuse during this period. So that call center was handling all of that. And, and another interesting thing we did is we partnered with government on private sector vaccination. So we get private sector to actually support government in, in their whole process of, of doing the vaccination just to speed up the rate at which we want to drive our vaccination. So basically, those are just a few of what we've done, we've done um, to really help the women in, 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 in the challenges um, around access, you know, the financial gap, the information, skills gap, capacity building, and regulatory. Thank you. All right, Flora, very encouraging. Uh, 
very encouraging to hear those initiatives that are helping to support uh, women-owned businesses, especially in this new uh, age, in this age of access. Lindeka, I'd like to bring you in here and also to continue on that point on around gender uh, lens uh, invest, impact investment. I know that there is a, it's a big market. Uh, and uh, private investors, institutions, uh, financial institutions are looking to tap into uh, that aspect of the market. Could you just share, talk to us about this market? What is changing? What are the trends? And how uh, women entrepreneurs on the African continent can tap into this or can have a piece of this? Thank you, Esther. Um, I just want to touch on uh, maybe before going to my, my points to what uh, Flora said. Um, in terms of the trends. And I think the biggest thing that we've seen when you start talking about access, you start talking about visibility, you start talking about people saying, where do I find them? We appreciate that the continent is 54 countries. Um, and uh, when we look for capital, we look for capital offshore. And those are not people that, uh, we're not China, I guess they don't have the time um, or, or the energy to actually uh, look at us uh, in that aspect. Um, so as a bank, we decided to make an investment. So when we started looking at what solutions, what do we see out there? So when you tell us talking about the, the explosion of ESG, it means there's an interest in women-owned businesses and financial inclusion. If you look about the SDG goals um, uh, that we all are focus on, we're focusing on, there's an interest there. And what we did was how we make sure that we find, we make the women visible so that it makes it easier for the capital to find them. We actually, as, as, as I said, this is a, actually the fund that we launched. I must actually always say this. It's an open adoption. It is, was just not our genius. It was a work at, um, that we partnered with, with UNECA uh, and, and their partners, the UN Women and the rest. Uh, but the goal was, how do we bring money into women businesses uh, and women uh, asset managers? And I think one of the things when you talk about visibility is, is critical. We actually launched a call to action campaign where we actually advertise in every language in terms of the regions on the continent to find uh, these women-owned funds businesses or women-led uh, investment businesses to make sure that we can actually find them. Secondly, and I think uh, it speaks to uh, our surprise, we actually thought we are going to have a challenge in terms of finding them. We actually have a better problem because we've found them, over 400 of them, and some that are investable and ready now and some are investable in the future. So what we wanted to do was to make sure we invest, we, we create that visibility and actually take them through the process, which is often critical uh, to investors when they're looking at a business to make sure that they can actually invest in them and they can worry about the investments, that's the skills and the money that they need to manage. Um, for us, that was critical in terms of saying that they are smaller of these versus your big institutions offshore. How do we bring them together in a fund of fund structure where it makes it easier for the investors to find them? And also the investment tickets can be huge. So in the fund of fund structure, we've already pulled them together. But also what's important was the education uh, and the support that's needed. So from a mentoring perspective, we're all at different levels in terms of our journeys from a, uh, a technical aspect of it, and more importantly, from an operational support. We know how hard it is to actually build businesses, but more importantly, especially when it comes into our space, the operational infrastructure, which is the risky part of the business, how do we actually support them with that? Because it's not that the interest is not there, Esther, the interest is there. It was actually how do we bring them together? How do we provide visibility so that you can actually allow for access? For that to happen. But more importantly, and I know that we're talking about SMMEs, I don't want us to lose the fact that when we talk about funds, they're the ones that then invest in these businesses. So for us, it's actually a pipeline to make sure that they all have that capacity to look at these businesses and actually provide a pipeline and a platform for us to not surely have that, but also make sure that these are the women businesses, women owned businesses that are there. So in terms of the theme, in terms of what we see in our space, ESG is huge. And also, if you look at uh, uh, looking for, uh, 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 for opportunities, if you look at Africa, we have research in this in terms of the trends that are driving the attractiveness of the continent. You're talking about it here, it's digital penetration. You're talking about it here, it's mobiles. Everybody on the continent is a mobile. So for us, it is how do we bring our solutions and products closer to our clients in the platforms that they have at, the, at their disposal? So there's a lot of driving that and also opportunity. And I think... Um, from a trends perspective, it is driven predominantly by ESG, which has financial inclusion. There's far more conscious capital now in terms of people that are looking to do well 
while doing good. And I think um, we have opportunities here. And in terms of growth, this is where we are in our demographics as a continent, youth, large youth. Uh, and I think for me, those are the quite a few trends that we see that are attracting investors into this space. But actually the challenge was, how do we bring to them businesses that we support, businesses that we know are economically viable, that businesses that we know we can also lend to uh, as an institution. And I think that's a bigger role that we play because that is work that needs to be done and also providing that exposure and those continuous opportunities and platforms for actually all businesses, not just women, but focused on women to actually be able to lend. And I think one of the key things that's important was the networking platform. And I think what are what has been maybe the gift of COVID is I'm looking at us here. Uh, I think Flora is in Kenya. Uh, Juliet is in Nigeria. Ida is right next door to me in Bryanston. And uh, you also in Nigeria. It is the platform for us to engage where before you'd had to jump on a plane. Now we can do this. We can bring visibility in terms of exactly what we're doing. This webinar where more and more people are listening. You know, and for me, what is interesting in terms of Africans, we are collaborators. There's a couple of institutions here that are working together and we're actually trying to solve our solve problems for ourselves because nobody's coming to save us. And I think the opportunities on the continent are vast. We just need to be able to direct investors and capital towards those opportunities. Um, and I think, Esther, I'll just, uh, I'm mindful that um, we, we have time and there's still a lot that we want to cover. I don't know if that, if you mind if I pause there. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Lindeka, for that. Juliet, let me come over to you. Now, Visa's market research revealed that while majority of women-owned small businesses feel more empowered now than they did uh, five years ago, the same cannot be said for micro-business owners. And now, many times when we talk about SMEs, we take sometimes we take for granted the smaller part of that uh, that category, that's the micro-businesses. Now, this research, uh, uh, it would appear that uh, they feel left behind. Could you speak to this point in terms of how we carry this category of businesses along in terms of, you know, obviously they, they're going to be equipped with the right technology tools and knowledge, et cetera, uh, the issues of affordability. You, I know you spoke to that point earlier, but also just speak to this point in terms of how we make sure that everyone is on board. The micro-business has been one that employs less than six people and operates immensely lean. Many African-based small businesses will fall in this category. And so, like you rightly said, it's so crucial that this category is not left behind. And where do we find these businesses? They are traders, they're grocers, farmers, teachers, gym instructors, artists, musicians, comedians, coaches, personal instructors, mechanics, electricians, hairdressers, tailors, and so on. Now, the good news is the fact that um, a lot of them have cell, cell phones. In fact, I would say 100% of them have cell phones. We know that Africa is the mobile first continent and a lot of people are having their entire digital experience and internet life via the mobile phone. So in order for these people to access the online economy, uh, they would need to upgrade to smartphones if they don't already have that. And this is where um, there's an important role for government and uh, relevant private sector to, uh, you know, when we think about, you know, access to data and access to devices, looking at uh, discounting smartphones and also uh, discounted data bundles for these segments so that they're able to, uh, you know, just first and foremost, uh, acquire that infrastructure and get online. And um, we must also recognize that there'll be many in this group that might not be able to navigate through online resources available to them to learn the basics of you know, e-commerce um, that we're talking about. And so again, it's important that there are targeted programs to meet their needs, targeted programs to help build capacity, to help them really understand the basics because it's also a different mindset when you're uh, doing your business offline and putting it online. There are new metrics, there's new language, there are new dynamics, there's a new way of engaging with customers. So it's very important that there are targeted programs to just really build capacity within this segment and also uh, uh, enable them to get access. And I think uh, this is also an area where corporates, NGOs, governments can just continue working together, you know, targeting and prioritizing micro-business owners for empowerment and enlightenment programs. 
You're absolutely right. Ida, let me bring you in here. Now, fintechs and mobile operators have become a key accelerators in driving financial inclusion, supporting traditional banking models. So how is Visa partnering with these groups to further close the access gap? Esther, fintechs have been instrumental in, in Africa. Um, um, they are vibrant pretty much across all markets, uh, ranging from uh, you know South Africa, Nigeria, Kenya, and uh, and more. You know what they are doing really is fast tracking the capability to provide access, both from a an acceptance standpoint, and what I mean by acceptance is the capability to accept payments when you're a business, or you know they are even entering the space now where they're contributing to um, providing what we call credentials and providing consumer with the capability to make um, digital payments. So um, they are a critical part of the ecosystem. Um, we've um, implemented a program by which you know, we are onboarding them and giving them access to um, you know, our capabilities, but also more importantly, about all of our tools from a security and risk management perspective. And in turn, they are just fast tracking, you know, the pace at which, you know, these small businesses access online or how these small businesses simply access digital payments. So it's definitely um, a win-win for the entire ecosystem. Um, and, you know, we've seen, you know, there's been a lot of conversation around the role that mobile network operators also are playing in that space in terms of access. Yeah, think about the you know touch points that they are creating, and uh, they've been doing extremely well in um, you know their closed loop environment. And now I understand that um, the market, the ecosystem, requires to have access to more of an open loop uh, type of um, of uh, ecosystem. And uh, this is where also we come into the picture and make sure that we help, you know, give them access to more consumers. We give them access to more countries because we're a global organization and uh, we benefit as well from the, um, you know, their dynamism and, and their reach. So it's a complete win-win uh, proposition, both, both from a consumer perspective, from a merchant perspective, and for all the players of their ecosystem. Thank you very much for that, Ida. Flora, let me move to you. We have about uh, eight minutes left, uh, so I guess I could give um, uh, everyone two minutes uh, just to begin to wrap this up. Now, Flora, what we know so far is that uh, women-owned businesses will have to uh, be ready to embrace, of course, uh, e-commerce, be ready, ready to embrace the digital future. Uh, would you say that this notion is widespread in terms of women-owned businesses wanting and having that desire to embrace uh, digital access, going online, getting more visibility for their businesses, etc.? I'll, I'll say yes, anybody today doing business would understand that it is completely important um, that that you become, you, you're playing in the di digital space. And as I have said, Kenya has skyrocketed the, the, you know, the mobile penetration. And in fact, I think we are the almost uh, digital leaders right now. And of course, there's been a lot of um, fintech solutions around this, you know, um, where you have the, the, the mobile money, the, the mobile money. Um, and PESA, where you don't actually have to have a lot of, you don't have to do it on internet. So, the, and, and on top of that, they've combined this with an agent model so that everybody's able to, to go and take, borrow their money, um, to take their money. You know, you can walk to an agent and actually have your money or receive it at an agent if you, if you really don't want it to, to come on, on your phone. So basically, I, I do see the future is continuing to, to be digital especially when it's, it, it's combined with, uh, with, with innovation in that, in that regard, so that you don't have to always rely on connectivity because you can imagine, especially as you go more and more rural, connectivity is definitely a problem. Of course, we, there's, I'm not ignoring it because when you have to show your goods or you know, if you're not gonna come to a physical market, then definitely um, the internet is going to be of paramount in, in importance. So it definitely will empower the women. And um, I'm, I'm really enjoying to hear what um, Ida is saying, 
Lindy K and Juliet, what you're saying you are doing to empower the woman. Because the, the more a woman is empowered in whichever way, whether it's you know getting me an, access to my platform, whether it's getting me, uh, getting me um, several different ways to make my payments, because let's face it, a customer is always right. If a customer wants to make a payment on a card, it's got to be a card. How do I understand it? Um, you know, is it accessible? Does it work for me? And then, um, Juliet, with all the beautiful trainings that you're saying that your, 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 your company is allowing, for me, I think the, the most important thing as an entrepreneur is that you're giving the, the, you're empowering the woman. So I don't have to go and sit in a class. I can do this in my own free time. I can, I can train myself. I can go at my pace. I don't have to go at my neighbor's pace or my pocket pace. And the more you do that to the women, the more we are going to see empowered women, not only thinking local, because remember now, and I think it's um, Nidika who said that, let's also start solving our own solutions. It will be, women will be able to do regional trade. Before you know it, women will be able to do, will, will be able to do global trade because I'm seeing other companies, and I like a, a conversation like this, you're seeing other people get on the bandwagon. I know, I think it was, I think it was DHL that during COVID that had an SME package. So all of a sudden I could show off, I mean, I, I remember one of my friends showing off her jewelry in her living room and she's saying, this is my marketplace and, and gets orders and ships them out to New York. So the more we support women within the supply chain, the more they're going to be empowered and, and, and the more right. they can actually be women. You know, and who, what is a woman? All right, you know, she's not just Flora, I'm, good, I'm going to have to... I'm going to have to come in here. Thank you so much, Flora. Uh, just quickly to move over to Juliet, your closing remarks. Obviously, we know, uh, we're hoping that uh, the notion of what it would take uh, in this new business reality is also a widespread uh, a notion here also in Nigeria. But just your closing thoughts on financial inclusion. Yes, I'll just mention three things very quickly. First would be to double click on the important role that fintech organizations are playing in helping to democratize financial access. They're opening up new sets of services, challenges, uh, and value opportunities for women. They're reducing uh, barriers, solving mobility constraints, and reducing transaction costs. And I think, uh, you know, fintech organizations and, um, you know, uh, financial service providers should be seen as key partners of regulators uh, and the public sector in just really closing the financial gender gap. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention as well is just the importance of data and data-driven policy, because uh, sometimes what we find is that lack of data perpetuates gender gaps in financial inclusion because there isn't sufficient information on the value uh, and the picture of the women's market and what they bring to the table. And so uh, just really looking at um, uh, disaggregating data to solve for that and having data-driven policy designs that can just help close the gap, financial product design, selection of delivery channels and things like that. And then the last thing I'll just say is the fact that um, I think we all uh, agree and you know we've seen the fact that digital transformation, whilst it was optional in the past well, and important, now it's just compulsory. There's, there's just no way to survive without that. And it offers a lot of flexibility. You're absolutely, more so you're absolutely right uh, there, Juliet. <laughs> you're absolutely <laughs> so, right. Uh, uh, Lindeka, yeah. if we could just take your take closing thoughts from you. I'm back before uh, anyone can tell me. I think for me, I think that what's important, I think in the environment that we're in, and I guess banks, um, and I think when you start talking about funding, what has been important is to make sure we keep these businesses alive. You know, I'm very much aware and we partner with fintechs, but I think what um, as a standard bank has been a big thing for us. It's not really what we do, which is banking, it's why we do it. And I think keeping this business alive during this time is critically important. And I think, uh, I, I remember last at the beginning of COVID, the bank provided 148,000 payment holidays that total 37 billion to businesses across the continent. That is imperative because before we can talk about anything else, we need to keep the lights on. And I think we're also doing a lot in terms of banking initiatives for women. I don't know if Laura, you're aware, but we've got Dada in Kenya, 
The story that I want to close with is um, when I was in London for this uh, Lionesses of Africa conversation, there was one of the entrepreneurs who's very successful now who was telling us what, when she went to the bank to ask for a loan, they asked where your husband is. That is, go ask him for the loan. And I think what we're seeing here is a change in that we're doing it for ourselves. And I think from a banking perspective, we want to make sure that we're very intentional and deliberate in terms of being where we need it the most in driving economic growth and making sure that we don't leave anyone behind with a huge gender focus, but also making sure that we keep the lights on. We need this business before we can provide any solutions. We need to keep them alive. And I think to close off, and I always find these conversations way too short, um, and I hope that while we have this conversation, a so what will be answered next time. So that we've set here, all of us, so what are we going to do differently? Where are we going to collaborate? Because for me, those are crucial. You know, we're providing our solutions on apps, we're doing things, but it is what we're going to do next that's going to be crucial. I wouldn't want to come here next time and be sitting here. We know the compelling cases for investing in women. We know the, the, the value of collaboration and driving the change that we want to see on this continent. So I'd like to make sure that we challenge each other to not only meet here and take it offline, to actually do more. We have way more platforms now and getting everyone on the without having to travel. So Esther, thank you for the opportunity. Visa, you are family. Juliet and Flora, you're my tribe. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Indeka, for that. On, and on that note, we've come to the end of this panel discussion where we've been talking about unlocking digital capabilities for African women uh, entrepreneurs uh, in the age of access. A very big thank you to all my panelists today. I've been your host, Esther Awuni. For myself, it's bye for now. <laughs>